And if you're looking for elegance, if you're looking for luxury, go to Portland. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is not the place. No. We are not going to be a facility that everybody's going to appreciate. Mm-hmm. We are 20 miles back from nowhere. We are out in the wilderness, uh, right in the middle of God's country. This is Bob Deshane's Wild Maine, a show about outdoor fun and adventure. And even before the show begins this morning on 92.9 The Ticket, I've already had plenty of adventure. Just getting to the spot with this microphone took me over some bumps and dips that I will still face again, heading out later on today. After a long winter, I can testify that the way up from Rockwood to the Golden Road is going to need some culvert work down the spring. But the mud is out and the dirt road up here is firm and it's a favorite time of year to visit historic Pittston Farm above Moosehead Lake. Today's entire show is outdoors, so if you hear a truck drive in, an airplane fly over, or a boat start up on Sabumic Lake over there, I can't do a thing about it. You probably already know about Historic Pittston Farm, but you might not know about the party they are throwing tomorrow. Jenny Mills is standing by to tell us all about it. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine is brought to you by EBS Building Supply, Van Raymond Outfitters, Napa Auto Parts, Hammond Lumber, and the Old Town Trading Post. Well, Jenny, I'm standing outside Historic Pittston Farm. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Bob. Well, it's nice to be back, and as you know, I come as often as I can. <laughs> yes, you're doing. We appreciate appreciate that. Well, the big reason I'm here is because coming tomorrow, uh, you're going to have the Friends of Historic Pittston Farm with a celebration, and I want to clue everybody into that right now. Great. We would appreciate it. It's uh, noteworthy. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do? Well, we're going to have a pig roast, number yeah. one, uh, and I need to establish that, is that the public understand that our business here is Historic Pittston Farm. Mm-hmm. That is a business. It's an LLC. But we have on premises a museum. It is a 501c3 nonprofit mm-hmm. uh, with a board of directors, offices, obviously, uh, etc., and that is actually called Friends of Pittston Farm. And why I'm so excited is that this is the first public announcement and our first fundraiser. We're inviting people to come. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's going to be inexpensive. We'll tell people how they can become involved in this wonderful organization that is going to celebrate the history mm-hmm. of Pittston Farm, celebrate the culture, um, the history of logging in this area for over hundreds of years, as well as the Native American history that goes back and dates back for a thousand years. Now, we're standing right outside the main lodge itself. Inside, there's a nice restaurant with wonderful food, because I eat there. Mm. (laughs) Uh, Good lodging. There's a a logo up above the porch that says 1907. Is that when this particular building was built? 1907 is when they actually started the operations here Mm -hmm. at at Piston Farm. Okay. Um, it wasn't historic it when wasn't they started. It wasn't historic <laughs> at that time. It's 1907 is when they actually started the operations. Great Northern Paper Company purchased the land in 1906. So they started their operations in 1907. Mm-hmm. This building that you're looking at uh, was built around 1911. Okay. And 1912. Mm-hmm. And Great Northern had five farms throughout the area, as most people know. But this is the very last one left. And that is why it's on the National Historic Register. Mm-hmm. Uh, seven of our buildings are. It'll be the lodge uh, that we're going to talk about now. It'll be the carriage house, which used to be the carriage houses and now a motel-type units, mm-hmm. all naughty pine interior finish. It'll be the blacksmith shop that we're really excited about because this building, uh, we need to do a lot of repair because it's going to fall into the <laughs> south branch of the Penob Scott River. Yeah. It, I wasn't going to say anything because <laughs> I was going to be polite, but that one no, needs some help. It needs help. Uh, but that's how Friends of Pittston Farm is going to be able to help. Mm-hmm. We know we qualify for grants because we are on yeah. the register and have been since 2000, year 2000, July, uh, June the 16th. But we need to get into the river, literally, and do some rip racking mm-hmm. along our bank because the natural path of the south branch of the Penobscot is an S. And the bottom of that S wants to run right into our <laughs> yes, bank. It does. So it is eroding away badly. Uh, we have a lot of items in there that is very valuable uh, to the historic aspect. And one of those, if you look at the outside of the building, you'll see two long, they look like two by eights. Mm-hmm. And when you look at that, the inside of that is where they obviously shod the horses Mm -hmm. uh, when Great Northern was here, and there was a big strap whereby the horses would literally walk up to the wall. They would take, think of it like a big girth that you would for a horse, Mm -hmm. and then they take it around the animal, and they literally lift it up on a hydraulic. (laughs) 
<laughs> so that they could actually shaw them safely, uh -huh. the blacksmiths. So that's just one thing in that building. I wonder and if that was a thrill for the horses. I mean, I bet it was a thrill. <laughs> I, I am sure it was a thrill. You ever seen a horse fly? <laughs> that's right. And besides that, there was there still is a uh, a hearth there. Mm -hmm. uh, and an area where the billows was. So we actually need to get that all cleaned out. Mm -hmm. There's junk in there now. It needs to be all cleaned out. And we've actually got some people that are craftsmen that have redone blacksmith shops over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, they're willing to come and help us. And they've done it for many different organizations like ours. Uh, we just need kind of a work group and some funds and money to do that. Yeah. So <laughs> that's just one example of one of our buildings. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's the history. I mean, before we, I want to do more history, but I also want to just look around and say, on that historic uh, blacksmith shop, there's a satellite dish. <laughs> <laughs> there's windmills, wind turbines going yes. in the background. Uh, you're doing everything you can to win yourself off fossil fuel, I'm sure. We are. Uh, and so you can expect some certain modern conveniences, Wi-Fi. Um, yes. I mean, you are, when you come to Historic Pittston Farm, you are way in the woods, and yet there's Wi-Fi available. That's correct. We are considered an outpost in the North Main Woods, and I'm amazed at the nine years that we have been here, how true that is. People depend immensely upon this institution being where it is mm -hmm. at. And the reason? Because it has been here and dependable for hundreds, for over a hundred years. Yeah. Uh, we are humbled and privileged at the same time to be able to do that. And we do, we guest, we have accommodations here currently for 112 people, mm -hmm. bedding for 112 people. Uh, we have Where in do the, you put them all? Well, I'm going to explain that to you, believe it or not. <laughs> okay. Here in the lodge that we're currently looking at, yep. on the second floor, we have nine rooms. Mm -hmm. On the third floor, we have six rooms. Uh, we do not use the third floor that frequently, mm -hmm. but in the spring, we have lodge retreats. We have a Christian men's retreat that comes here, and we have women's retreats, kids' retreats, youth, and the rooms upstairs are really very large, so mm -hmm. they'll accommodate about eight people per room. And then we've got some other rooms that are smaller. We have a couple of interconnecting rooms, so it's great for that. Uh, we also have the regular hotel rooms on the second floor, whereby there are double, double beds and, and twin beds in each room, mm -hmm. uh, bathrooms on each with showers, and the cloth foot tubs oh, as well. Cool. <laughs> People love those. Yep. They really do. It is very nostalgic to go into our lodge. There's patchwork quilts mm -hmm. that are handmade all over our beds in that premise. That's just one of our buildings. The other place that we put rooms, as I mentioned before, is the carriage houses. Now, there are seven of those. Carriage house because that's exactly what it was. When yeah. Great Northern built it, that is what it was. There's it's where they kept their carriages. Photos in the museum that show the carriage house when it was a carriage house, and you can see where you're going to be bedding down is where the horses used to bed. That down. is right. <laughs> that is absolutely right. And the uh, late night, uh, about 1997, in that vicinity, these units were renovated. Uh, the post and beam construction you can still see when you go into them mm -hmm. and they're small units but they're cozy yes, and they <laughs> they're all naughty pine interior finish with bathrooms mm -hmm. uh, with Wi-Fi uh, with wonderful linens and uh, heat that is either electric or uh, LP yeah. and those are our main accommodations people love those because they're only as you can see about 20 feet from where the food is served <laughs> <laughs> I, that, that's where the only the only rooms I've ever stayed in when I've been here is in the carriage houses, and I just love it. And if you're looking for elegance, if you're looking for luxury, go to Portland. <laughs> this exactly. Is, <laughs> this is not the place. No. We are not going to be a facility that everybody's going to appreciate. Mm -hmm. We are 20 miles back from nowhere. We are out in the wilderness, uh, right in the middle of God's country. It really is. It truly is. It's natural beauty like I have not seen, mm -hmm. um, and I'm a native of the state of Maine. We're at the confluence of two beautiful and historic rivers. Yeah, let's, in fact, let's walk over to the edge of the field over here. That sounds good. If you're just tuning in, I'm at Historic Piston Farm in Subumic, just above Moosehead Lake. There is a party and a pig roast going on here tomorrow. Jenny Mills is my guest. On the lake, I can see a bunch of green-winged teal, a few American widgeons, some ring-necked ducks, a handful of mallards and black ducks, and a peregrine falcon just went over a moment ago. The tree swallows chased him out. It's no wonder I love this place. It's Bob Duchesne's Wild Bane on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket.
Welcome back. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Main on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. And it's hard being me. There are radio announcers stuck inside studios all over Maine right now doing shows that you aren't listening to. Meanwhile, I'm up here at Historic Pittston Farm with Jenny Mills. And we're looking out across the fields to the rivers and lake beyond. It's not hard to guess why Great Northern Paper established a major base of operations here. In the fields, where the North Branch and the South Branch of the Penobscot River come together, the soil was fertile for over 100 acres of crop land to feed the lumberjacks and pasture to feed the horses. Subumic Lake is right over there. Even before white settlers got here, this must have been a major travel route, Jenny. Exactly, it was. And this is why we're celebrating the Native American history. Now, you've got to understand, I do not know all the history. I'm not even going to begin to tell you that I do. Mm -hmm. But I'm learning. And a lot of things that I've learned through reading, through uh, some uh, college professors that have studied this history, that have written books on this history, uh, is that where you are standing right now, looking at what we call the confluence of the two rivers, and uh, that would be right in front of our flagpole, Mm -hmm. looking out onto the water, there is an island that separates these two rivers, as you can see. The north branch coming down from our north and the south coming around our lodge. And that's where the Indians would do their trading in the summer. Mm. The Penobscot Indians would go down in the wintertime on Penobscot Bay, which makes sense. We like to go to Florida in the wintertime, right, Mm -hmm. where it's a little warmer. They obviously could not exist up here in this type of climate. Uh, Number one, they had no water uh, without constantly putting ice out and uh, digging and so they go down to Penobscot Bay and then in the spring they would navigate come up to this Mm. area and they would meet other Native Americans that would come in believe it or not from New York and other places (laughs) now what do you suppose they still do that (laughs) and they still do that today it hasn't changed and that's why we love it Mm -hmm. you can go out and canoe in this river and from the water you can see this whole complex now, you were right on the edge of Subumic Lake as well. So you've got the two rivers coming together, and then you've got the wetlands uh, edge of the lake as it extends out away from Pittston Farm. Yes. That's pretty impressive as well. Do you know what Subumic means? In I believe uh, it's an Indian term, yeah, obviously. Got that. And I honestly think, because they would come and boom logs, mm-hmm. I don't know when this was actually named. I don't know how long it's been called Subumic. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Great Northern maybe changed the name or mm-hmm. if the... Native Americans named it, so I couldn't answer that, but I can tell you this. You asked about what these two rivers were used for. Mm -hmm. Logging, obviously logging. And you would not have been able to look out like we're looking out today and see just natural beauty uh, from the beginning of 1970, Mm -hmm. from 1970 back, because you'd have seen nothing but logs this time of year. That's right. Nothing but logs. It would have been an extremely busy place (laughs) with hundreds of river drivers climbing those logs, putting them all together Mm -hmm. behind machinery and uh, boats and uh, to get them down these rivers because you're going to understand that people that were involved in the logging industry, the cutters came in the wintertime up here. Oh, yeah. And, in fact, they right? still do. And yes. they still do, <laughs> yeah. but for a very good purpose. Everything was frozen. Exactly. You can get stuff out. They can get stuff out. So mm-hmm. they would push it to every, or pull it, however they could get it to every body of water up here in the North Main Woods. And, obviously, when nature took its course, mm-hmm. long about April and May, guess what? Down the rivers that they went and down into two major rivers at this point. Okay. Yep. One of those was actually Moosehead Lake, mm-hmm. and the other one was actually uh, down towards the Penobscot River and out into Penobscot Bay. Now, this river that you're looking at yes. is kind of interesting to me because I learned this, which is kind of an interesting fact. I always assumed, not being from here but three hours south, that this went into Moosehead Lake. It does not. This flows down towards the west branch of the Penobscot, so you've got the north and the south yep. mm-hmm. that meet up in the end of Subumic Lake and form the west branch of Penobscot, which winds its way down through Caribou Lake, it downs over Repajimus Dam, mm-hmm. and eventually Penobscot and out through Penobscot Bay. So this water that you see Even does though not, we're that close to Moosehead Lake, does even, not go into Moosehead Lake. Even <laughs> though, and when I say we're close, we're yeah. extremely close. Yeah. We're less than a quarter of a mile between where the dam is and where the north portion of Moosehead Lake is. Mm-hmm. And at one time in 18, I believe it was 64, because it was uh, in the vicinity of around the Civil War era, there was a company, it was called, it was either called Gardner Lumber Company, and I think it was called Gardner Lumber Company, that petitioned the Maine State Legislature (laughs) 
they to did that have, a lot. And they did that a lot. They had an idea that they wanted to use all of this water. Mm-hmm. North, south branches, the Penobscot and Moosehead. And so because they tried to do that, then they ended up petitioning to put in a sluice way mm-hmm. to divert the water so they could do it to both rivers. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> in it, fact, that happened all over the main woods. Yeah, I'm sure. So that wasn't the only thing. But it was yeah. kind of an interesting fact to me. They put 300 men on it to work mm-hmm. on it. And they only had it going for just a couple, maybe about a year, two years, three years. It was a short period of time. Mm. And then they ended up selling their investment to somebody else. <laughs> so so as we look out here, you can hear the history of it. The reason they put it here is because of the confluence of the rivers, the fact that you can boom logs across the Boomic Lake. So this was a good place for logging. However, it's now a great place for outdoor sporting adventures. Oh, because absolutely. Because you've got all the same advantages. Fly fishermen, I'm mm-hmm. sure, love the rivers. They do. You can go out in boats and do boat fishing from the middle of Sabumic. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of fish here. There is a lot of fish. And we have a, a nice strain of native brook trout. People say, well, what else do you have? Native brook trout. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we have. And uh, there's some wonderful fish. Obviously, they're a little bit smaller in the springtime. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in September, that changes. And uh, we can have anywhere... A lot of people in our campground, and we have an RV park as well, uh, a lot of people in our campground are seasonals, and they can't wait for September because we can, I've seen people up here with large fish anywhere from 18 inches to 20, oh, 25 <laughs> inches for mm-hmm. native brook trout. And the catch them on a fly line is yeah. spectacular. Mm-hmm. So they've enjoyed that very much. So you also have kayaks. We rent canoes and we rent kayaks for people to go out and enjoy. And distance-wise, I mean, you can literally walk right out our door, go down to our driveway, walk through the field, and you're right on the rivers. And because and of the quiet. location, it's sheltered, too. I mean, you're It's not, very sheltered. If you want to paddle Moosehead Lake, you're going to have to deal with wind. But around here, yes. when you've got the streams, you've got islands, yes. you've got the forest right next to the water, you can avoid some of the harsher conditions and have a great paddle. That is very true. Um, I've had the chance to go up to as far as we can with the North Branch. We've done that on a Sunday afternoon. There are some nice sandy beaches up there mm-hmm. uh, with little tiny rocks, not complete sand, but just you know, little tiny rocks. All you can hear are the birds chirping and singing. That's mm-hmm. all you can hear. An occasional moose that might go across your path. Uh, maybe some little varmints that'll flow in front of you or a beaver. But it is really a spectacular canoe ride. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it's formed in such a way, because this is all damn controlled, that you can actually get off in the rivers mm-hmm. and... If you get a storm and thunderstorms come up here, we get some violent th- thunderstorms. So you can actually get off the rivers anywhere, yeah. anywhere very, very easily. So it's a safe river mm-hmm. and lake system to be on. Now, as you look out of the buildings, uh, you can see another barn down the ro- down towards the lake. Uh, you've got a chapel over there, and we've got a museum right near us. Yes. I suggest we go visit the museum. That sounds like a great idea. It's about a three-minute walk. You have just enough time to refresh your coffee. I'm with Jenny Mills. We're at Historic Pittston Farm, and there's a party in pig roast coming up tomorrow. This whole show is your invitation. It's Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine may sound a little different today here on 92.9 The Ticket. I'm way up in the woods at Historic Pittston Farm, and I'm outside for this entire show except for this little piece where Jenny Mills and I are stepping into the museum right now. So what was this building, Jenny? This building is, first of all, when Great Northern was operating, it was called the Upper Barn. There Mm -hmm. were three barns, and this was called the Upper Barn. Obviously, this is where the horses were kept. Uh, When Great Northern went out of business, um, the High Adventure Group from the Boy Scouts as you can see by the sign that's behind us, uh, says the adventure that lasts a lifetime. Yes. Uh, the High Adventure Group was here and during the summers. And Great Northern, at, at that point in time, we're talking in the late 70s, early 80s, were tearing down their buildings as fast as they could, uh, liability issues, and they mm-hmm. were concerned about. So they had an employee at that time by the name of Mr. Twitchell. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Twitchell was a cook. Mm-hmm. They used to call him cookies. But he was a cook for Great Northern, for the guys out in the woods, down towards the Lobster Lake region. And uh, great, as they were going out of business, they needed somebody to protect what buildings they hadn't torn down yet yeah. and to be a night watchman. So he came over here 
to kind of watch what went on. And he did that for several years, and he fell in love with this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fell in love. And as a result, when he's tearing down this middle barn that is gone, yeah. he said, I can't do it anymore. He says, this is wrong. I'm tearing down history. Mm -hmm. And he petitioned the president still of Great Northern at that time in Millinocket and said, I want to buy it. Mm -hmm. And they said, no. He went four years, right in a row. Same time, same day, and asked to buy it. No, 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 no. So finally, when they were able to buy it, when they were able to buy it in 1992, they came over here and they started to take care of the important artifacts that were here from Great Northern and at least get them in one place. They knew how important it was. Mm -hmm. And then in 2000, they ended up with the help of Senator Snow to get this location named as a National Historic Site. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of our museum. So I wanted to give you just a little, people a little bit of history of that. Well, one of the nice things about the museum is one wall is lined with tools. The other wall is lined with ancient photographs. So if you want to know what history looks like, you can get it firsthand right here. So we're actually looking at the, is this lower yes. stable? Is this? The first, yes, this is the lower stable, mm -hmm. or what they call the lower barn. Yeah. That barn we still use today mm -hmm. for our animals, yeah. uh, for our boa goats, for our horses, and we got a couple of head of cattle down there. And that... As you can see, the barn, today this wouldn't go of it too much, because <laughs> yeah. you can see the rivers, the Subumic Lake, actually, yeah. right beside it. Mm -hmm. But obviously, we're all grandfathered, because there has been active farming going on yes. here since, eight, since 1906, when Great mm -hmm. Northern bought it, and before then. Yeah. So, uh, that's, you're right, that's the lowest stable. Well, the, here, here's something I didn't expect. Yep. Uh, next to the blacksmith shop, shop, there are power lines, big oh, ones. Oh, yes, Where big did the power, power come from? They, they made their own power, believe it or not. When Great Northern came, they came with generators. And they also, if you notice, there's not only power lines, but we also have telephone. <laughs> Would you believe that in 1887, I believe the date was, mm -hmm. telephone lines were strung up here? And the museum is in evidence of that. Great Northern had the most extensive, and I believe they were either one of, either the first or the second people in the state of Maine even including Southern Maine, that actually had telephone systems at that time. And they actually um, would have conversations with Philadelphia, with mm. Boston, with San Francisco, New York, anywhere. They had a telephone operator that was in each one of their buildings. Well, I think there's two major points to make. The first is that back at that time, Northern Maine was the economic engine of the state. I think that is true. Yeah. And secondly, of course, this was an industrial area. There was much more populated than it is now. Oh, very it, far, far said, much. Hundreds and hundreds of people up here were nowadays, all you find is peace and quiet and relaxation. That is correct. So it's, it's had a transformation, yeah. a metamorphosis, mm -hmm. as you might say. And, and Bob and I, as the owners of of Pittston Farm realized that it was such a change because uh, you see these photographs and you said, oh my gosh, it doesn't look anything like no. this today. <laughs> look, look at the Lombard haulers on sleighs. Uh -huh. Look at This is the upper stable that we're in currently. This is one of the jobs that the river drivers did and this is Mr. Lavasa in this, in this photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, he worked up here for 30 years. He was one of the foremen and uh, quite a colorful character. I had the chance to meet him and talk with him, mm -hmm. and it was exciting, but I don't think it's a job that I'd want to be no. doing. <laughs> I'm just surprised he survived 30 I years. I am too. We're looking at a photo of them out in the river poking logs down through the rapids uh, and with long poles, and that just doesn't look safe. And, you know, we actually asked him how he ended up getting the people to work here during mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. And what he told me, True or not, probably was true. He says, the only way we could get some people to work here is he says, I visited some of the county jails in the area, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of these men were quite hard kind of <laughs> dudes. Yeah. And uh, he said they came up here to work, and they get enough money so that they could uh, buy whatever they wanted. They were very uh, entrepreneurs, you might mm -hmm. want to say. Mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting history. Those were self-reliant days. They were self-reliant days. Yeah. Here's a picture of this one here. This is one of the log cabins that you would say, mm -hmm. or hovels. I, to me, it looks more like a hovel. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, where they would have, they would assign a cook mm -hmm. at each one of these hovels, mm -hmm. and there would be anywhere from probably ten to maybe twelve, a dozen mm -hmm. of people. I don't think you could fit much more than that. But they were in bunks. And in the middle is where they'd have the heat. Now, please remember, this happens in the winter yeah, time, okay? <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. Not in June and July and August. And and they the cook would take care of their meals, uh, they'd heat their water for washing, etc. And 
depending upon what, what generation you're in, it might be two weeks, it might be three weeks that mm-hmm. they would be out in those conditions. Here's a funny photo, the dynamite house. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. That's not the one I want to sleep near. No, no. But that was a very important aspect because they, uh, they had to use dynamite for many, many different jobs, Great Northern did, and uh, as we do today. And that was a very, uh, what you might say, kind of a secured area. <laughs> Yeah, For I mean, obvious reasons. I, I, you probably didn't even have to put up warning signs. People probably just knew. They did. No smoking there. They <laughs> did. You can see a picture here. Mm-hmm. I kind of like this photograph here. Mm-hmm. Again, you can see all the great big pots and the stoves and the wood that they use. You know, even the little hovels look kind of cozy. Yeah. You can see that there was also two boarding houses here. Just a quick mention of that. This is the one that we, the one in the front, yep. which is mm-hmm. right above the museum, yep. is what we have now. Yes. And you can see an old vehicle. I don't know. If yeah. that's a, it looks like a Ford. Yeah, it looks I like a... Beyond that, I don't not know. Not quite a Model T, maybe a Model A. I, Mabel, a Model yeah. A. And if you look closely in that photograph, mm-hmm. the porch that we came out today and we looked up with the peak is exactly what we looked at today. Yeah. But in the back of this building, in the back of this is another building, mm-hmm. a larger building, and that one is actually one that we just saw here on one of the photographs. It's right here. Oh, the boarding house. It was mm-hmm. actually the boarding house. The footprint you can still see. Mm-hmm. It happens to be where our game <laughs> where our, where our game pole is okay. for our hunters. Uh-huh. It is our hopes that the museum, uh, Friends of Piston Farm, will be able to build a couple of buildings back. Mm-hmm. This is one of them. Oh, that'd be cool. That was torn down. Mm-hmm. It was pilfered, so to speak, with all of the materials that was in it. Yep. And I will ask everybody out there, if they have any interior pitches Mm -hmm. of this boarding house, please bring them. Please bring them on the 18th Mm -hmm. and share them with us. We'll get copies and we'll get them back to you because Mm -hmm. we don't have any good interior photographs. We want to rebuild that. And we want to rebuild the middle barn. Mm -hmm. Just to give everybody an idea, we've only covered the first quarter of the photos during our discussion of the last moment. You really do get to see an awful lot of history inside the museum. Mm -hmm. Tools on the other side, you've got ancient telephones. (laughs) I mean, really ancient. That is correct. (laughs) They look like something you would use in a war field, don't they? A couple of them. I mean, hand crank. And that's really what they were. Mm -hmm. They were for the loggers out in the woods. Mm -hmm. I'm going to assume that might be 20s, 30s Mm -hmm. era. Yep. Uh, where they, they were kind of radios, mm-hmm. uh, two-way radios that they could talk and, and get supplies and information on. Um, cross-cut saws, obviously here. Some old insulators that are here. All kinds of implements for, obviously, logging for hooks and mm-hmm. for ice cutters and for containers. It's kind of fun. PVs. To, <laughs> PVs, a lot of PVs in this area. Uh, it's kind of fun to have uh, parents bring their kids in to see if the mm-hmm. kids can identify what's here. I don't think some of the adults can identify and some it. right <laughs> some of the adults there are things that i look at that i don't know what they are well, and they this, have to right be here labeled. auger for boom logs what did they auger well they had to auger down inside so that they could keep these logs together mm-hmm. so the boom logs that were ah, actually okay. in the lake they would they would take all these logs so that they weren't going mm-hmm. hither thither and yawn mm-hmm. so to speak they had to corral them like cattle and okay. that's exactly what these booms looked like that looked like a big corral mm-hmm. so they had to build corrals yep. for these logs and i would assume that's how they did it so they put big pins in them yep and so it's like a them huge down. two-handed drill where they would just bore out i'm sure whatever it took to fasten whatever them. it took to fasten them together right. and probably put mm-hmm. one of those nails down there yeah. okay. that is exactly right now there's a couple of other things here if you look up at the far end of the museum in mm-hmm. front of the sign you see this thing that's got four wooden poles in it a turnstile like. yes a turnstile mm-hmm. those were on the boats that mm-hmm. came up to haul the logs, like the Katahdin. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Katahdin was a workhorse, as yes. everybody knows. <laughs> yes. That was a workhorse, and that's such a wonderful, wonderful thing to preserve that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they would take these turnstiles that'd be on the boats, and that's how they would take the ropes and tighten it up mm-hmm. and uh, lug the logs down the, down the lakes. And you, there's a lot of archives a lot of material that needs to be archived in these buildings. We have receipts from Great Northern. We mm-hmm. have uh, cost reports. We have uh, invoices that are upstairs in these boxes. So you can just begin to see the work that, that we yeah. need so to So you're going to need a lot of Friends of Historic Pits we and Farm. Are. <laughs> we, we are going to need a lot. Let's uh, go over to the um, chapel. Okay. That sounds wonderful. Bob Duchesne's Wild Main happens everywhere but a studio. We're lucky today up here at the historic Piston Farm. It was a late winter and the black flies aren't out yet. 
In another week, we'd probably be running over to the chapel. I'm with Jenny Mills. There's a party and pig roast tomorrow up here at the farm. And in a few minutes, we'll explain exactly how you can save a spot for yourself. This is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Main on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. I'm with Jenny Mills up here at Historic Pittston Farm, about 20 miles north of Rockwood, not too far from the far end of Moosehead Lake. We haven't talked about it much, but there's another reason I come up here, and I even lead tours up in this area. Just around the corner, a bridge crosses the south branch of the Penobscot River. Beyond the bridge is the checkpoint for the North Main Woods Association. It's an area I love to explore, mostly for rare and unusual birds, but also just because I run into moose a lot and a few bears now and then. In certain seasons, there really aren't many people up here, and you've got a lot of the forest all to yourself. I even got up here early enough this morning to do a little scouting along the uh, South Branch Access Road. It's that time of year when ruffed grouse are stepping in the road constantly. I've seen a bunch, and they're not even that timid this time of year. So, Jenny, um... We've been walking to the chapel, and I believe we have arrived. Yes. Now let's go in and take a look at the chapel. Mm-hmm. How many weddings a year do you think to get? Um, average two to four, depending mm-hmm. upon what's going on. <laughs> we'll talk about a destination wedding because <laughs> you've got all the lodgings and the kitchen. That's <laughs> so correct. You can really do it all right here. Yes. Um, when we purchased this uh, facility. Uh, the selling point for yours truly really was this. Mm-hmm. We're looking at it. Uh, as you come into the chapel, uh, you'll find pews for seating approximately 120 people. The chapel has been completely renovated, and it is lovely. It's got a wonderful pulpit. Uh, we have a piano, and we have a keyboard. Uh, I'm a pianist as well. <laughs> I, I, and I'm a notary. Uh, so I literally... When you come here to Piston Farm for a wedding, I can probably help you out. Yes, right. And uh, I've had the thrill to marry two or three uh, different couples that have been here. Mm -hmm. And the weddings are great. Uh, We had a wedding for a couple where she was brought up here. And and, uh, they were married in their 40s, and they just adored it. They never thought of anywhere else to go other than here. And we were thrilled to have them. And they loved the history here. Her father was an accountant for Great Northern. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you look directly ahead of us, you can't help but see that beautiful stained glass yes. window. Besides that, we we also have kind of unusual maybe for ch- for a chapel, but not anymore because the church is now uh, areas where people gather mm-hmm. and times are changing, and so aren't we here. So we try <laughs> to keep up with the times. Well, uh, it always used to happen in church basements, but you don't have a basement. <laughs> we don't have a basement, and and what we've got is a pull down screen. Yep. Uh, we do all. We use also a PowerPoint projector mm-hmm. that is right here in our ceiling, and it's our Wi Fi as well. Yep. So we can do presentations. You have been here I, with your birding groups. I have done presentations in here. Yeah, and it really is wonderful to be able to use this mm-hmm. not only as our place of worship, and we have services Sundays at 1030 from about the middle of May uh, through till the end of November. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes I have visiting pastors. Sometimes I'll do the service myself. Uh, sometimes we have two. Sometimes we have 22. Mm-hmm. But it's open. It's always open to the public like any mm-hmm place of God would be. Because yeah. so, this is not locked. No, no, no. it's never locked. <laughs> right. It's mm-hmm. never locked. We have heating in here. Um, we haven't done it in the winter time simply because that's our busy, busy season mm-hmm. and there's just not enough people around. You know, if you wanted to do a, repre- a retreat but all your people are always on cell phones, <laughs> come here because cell phones won't work. That is a perfect, perfect, perfect <laughs> point. Uh, I was here for a service last a week ago, Friday night, and we had 120 men in this place, and it was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. It was packed right to the hill. And so it's my favorite place to be. It's a place, literally, you've heard about a little chapel in the woods. Mm-hmm. Well, this is exactly what it is. And uh, we'd love to have people come and see it. Uh, what's so nice about doing weddings here is that they can have the ceremony in here, mm-hmm. and they can have the reception outside. <laughs> right with right on waterfront property, mm-hmm. and that's happened a lot. And then they have their dance here, and they we bring a platform in for them, and and it is just a lot of fun. Uh, we do weddings not only in the summer, but we did one last year. I performed a ceremony in the winter. <laughs> Everyone coming in on snow sleds? No, no. <laughs> it, no they, she was had a beautiful gown. It was a gorgeous wedding, and it was right down by the South Branch. Mm-hmm. So it's everything, and we can do it quite quite economically for people. All right. Now, with, let's walk back out here. Mm-hmm. And 
we'll continue to talk about tomorrow's event. Um, oh, okay. Because we want people to come. If they can't come this time, at least come sometime. Yes. Uh, and so let's talk about how to get here. Where are you? We are uh, approximately two and a half hours from Bangor's Drive. Mm -hmm. Take Route 15 right out of Bangor and follow Route 15 all of the way to Rockwood, Maine. Yep. That's the best way to tell people. When you get to the little village of Rockwood, don't blink twice <laughs> because you will go by. Yep. When you get to the Moose River store, mm -hmm. you're going to see a big wooden moose on the right. Right after that, turn right and go across the bridge. Yep. At the end of the bridge, bear right. Mm -hmm. And you just continue to bear right for 20 miles. And you will see our big white sign that says Historic Piston Farm with a flag out front. And it's really pretty easy to find. Yeah, once you get to Rockwood, there are signs at all the major places where you've got to be paying attention. So. Yes, we've got signs up with our logo on there to just kind of guide people in. Well, I remember... The first time I ever came out here, and I think I've told you the story before, we're just walking by the generators right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, my wife and I were just out driving in the woods. We like to do that every now and then. And we were driving up here, and all of a sudden I come across Pittston Farm, and it's like, I didn't know this was here. <laughs> my God, look at this. This is way in the woods. <laughs> that it, was about 25 years ago. <laughs> it is quite a surprise. It is a. This place isn't for everybody, as we've said, mm -hmm. but... Our business is about 75% repeat business. Mm -hmm. um, and depending, because we have hunting, we have fishing, we have these 30 rooms. Uh, as I said before, we have cabins. Uh, we also have mobile home type units that we house people. So whether you get, you know, we're here for any function that you could mm -hmm. possibly want. Reunion, birthday, hunting. Which historically was the case because this was essentially the base camp. It had to have everything you needed in the woods that's 100 right. years ago. That's right. And it has not deviated from that today. As mm -hmm. an example, last night I had a lady stop. She was on her own. She had had a flat tire. Mm -hmm. She was heading to a campground in the area. She didn't know anything but the fact Piston Farm was here and mm -hmm. she could use a telephone. Mm -hmm. So she used the phone. Now, this is what happens. We have people in the wintertime that are snowmobiling yep. that know we're here, mm -hmm. are in the fall during honey season. When I wake up in the morning and go up to the lodge, I've had people on my couch <laughs> because they literally got lost yeah. <laughs> or they were broke down. Mm -hmm. It is an outpost, and we provide all of the services, whether it be Wi-Fi, whether it be uh, telephone, a food, mm -hmm. obviously. And I just feel, and my husband does, that is the right thing to do. Uh, we've got to take a break while Jenny and I continue walking back up the drive toward the lodge. During the break, get something to write with because we'll have the web address, the phone number, the Facebook stuff in just a few minutes so that you can let Jenny know you want to come up tomorrow for the pig roast. In fact, I'll find out what the actual schedule for the pig roast is tomorrow when Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine returns in a moment from historic Pittston Farm on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. Welcome back to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is one of those special shows where I'm outdoors in one of my favorite places, Historic Pittston Farm. It's one of the big base camps Great Northern Paper built way up here in the Maine woods over a century ago. When log drives stopped in the early 70s, a road network and increased mechanization made farms like this obsolete. And it's only because of people like Bob and Jenny Mills that we have this important piece of Maine history preserved. Which is caretakers of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we get to make the mortgage payments. But, <laughs> yeah, right. But Which is not easy to do, by no. the way. Another reason we need friends of Historic Pits and Farm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but this is just a beautiful spot uh, in this part of the state. And it's under-advertised. Mm -hmm. And this is so much appreciated because we want people to come on the 18th, find out how they can become members of Friends of Piston Farm. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk about that. If they want to come to our business meeting at 1, they're welcome to. Yeah, let's talk about the schedule. You're going to have the pig roast at... At 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock. So right. business meeting at 1. Business at 1, mm -hmm. and we will be... Uh, and people are welcome. We're going to talk about different, probably, tiers of donation, how mm -hmm. people can be involved in that. And don't think it's because you... Maybe you don't have any money that you can squeak out of your tight budget. We understand that, trust mm -hmm. me. But, you know, if people can give it their time, yeah. one of my, one of my uh, suggestions as an officer will be a donation of a certain amount of hours. Mm -hmm. And that pays the family membership for the year. Yeah. If, and you see a lot of that. I'm thinking Leonard's Mills over in Bradley. 
Okay. Same deal. You get a lot of. They don't have any money, but they have a lot of volunteers. <laughs> That's and, right. And what they recreate there is not Amazing. dissimilar. To here. This is much bigger here. Yes. But, um, but it's the same kind of thing. It's you don't have to give money. You don't have to give money. Don't misunderstand me. We yeah. need money. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because curators and uh, archiving and and systems to do this doesn't come without that. Right. But there's so much to do, and we would probably try to work out some work groups for mm -hmm. people, different weekends throughout the year, mm -hmm. and that way they can come. So we'll talk about that during the schedule, during the afternoon on Sunday when people come. We'll give tours of all of our buildings. We'll try to answer any questions that anybody may have about the history, about Friends of Pittston Farm. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to make lists of people that can <laughs> do, what is your talent? <laughs> what is your talent? And, and we we aren't fussy, folks. Uh, right. We will take anybody of age, any age, size, description, and talent. Mm -hmm. Whether it's cleaning out a building and putting three piles on the ground, save, throw away, recycle. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important that people just come because we can't, the, the Friends of Piston Farm, like Historic Piston Farm, we don't have the funds to take out large ads. Right. So it's only through mm -hmm. your graciousness and uh, other people that people are going to know about this. Hey, somebody else use, uh, owns a radio station. I just borrow it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's another whole group of people who may not be able to contribute labor, may not be able to contribute money, but who yes. have oh. either knowledge or actual historical artifacts that could be of interest to the museum. Exactly. In fact, this is going to be a strange request, folks. Uh -huh. um, but I've here every single week three or four times a week people will come in and they can't wait to come uh, I had a call yesterday from a guy in California his father-in-law uh, his father-in-law's dad worked here mm -hmm. and they're coming back in July to see this place and so I couldn't wait to tell them about what we were doing and if anybody in the area by any chance worked in this area and they have artifacts that mm, when they left mm -hmm. they may have decided it's all gonna be torn down it's all gonna be wasted you know, if those just appear here, that would be wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> questions asked. Uh, we would we would appreciate any donations mm -hmm. having to do with the log, and specifically if it was if it was actually marked Great Northern mm -hmm. or or that kind of thing. We want that to come back. One thing that I would like just to mention quickly before we finish up here is that our ideas for the museum. We don't know what they all are, but. My my thoughts is that in the museum itself, we would like to have some kind of an acrylic wall with all the names of people that may have worked here. Oh, that would be so cool. <laughs> and what they did, what their job yeah. was uh -huh. here, and a little antidote. If the families or spouses or grandchildren have pictures mm -hmm. or a little antidote, I want this to be the people's museums, the generations of children that can come you know, that had relatives that worked here. And that's the way it's going to succeed. This isn't going to be a museum where you can't touch. It's not going to be that kind of museum. Mm. It's going to be a museum that you can come and bring your friends and relax completely and say, see, my grandfather did that. Mm -hmm. This is my grandfather on the wall. And maybe we'll put bricks in the floor or something like that. That's how, you know, donations of mm. $50 a brick or, or whatever to get that up. I don't have it all up in my head as to how it's going to be done. Mm -hmm. But that's just some of our thoughts. Okay. Now, for tomorrow's event, um, yes. it would be best if people contact you ahead of time. Uh, because you got to know how much food to have. So That's right. how do they reach you? Phone, email, what? Well, by both. Mm -hmm. um, I've sent out some newsletters to about 400 people. Um, and if you have one of the newsletters that has been sent, just email me back and say, mm -hmm. I need two tickets. And I'll email you a ticket. It's $10 per ticket for adults 12 and up. It is $10. From 11 to 5, it's 5 bucks. Mm -hmm. Under 5, just walk them all on. Bring them right in. What's the website again? And the website is www.pittstonfarm.com. And they can also call mm -hmm. uh, at 280-0000. Uh, they can catch me on Facebook um, or obviously just email me directly and we'll send the tickets out that way. Don't stay home because you've missed the deadline. <laughs> right. Please come. <laughs> Tomorrow's a day, so be here at Historic Piston Farm. And uh, our menu is going to be very simple, but every single dollar will go towards the museum. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be having, we're roasting pigs, and we're going to have bean hole beans. It'll be cornbread, um, coleslaw, uh, our homemade apple pie, and our own homemade ice cream and oh, beverage. 
the homemade ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that chocolate ice cream you make, and I feel like it's so sinful I need to go to confession after <laughs> eating it. <laughs> well, we think our food is pretty good, and that literally is made from scratch right here. It's a cooked product and uh, mm-hmm. frozen here and packaged. <laughs> And that is where we'll end the show today, ice cream. My guest has been Jenny Mills, and we've been walking around historic Pittston Farm up here in the Maine woods, on the shore of Sabumic Lake, right where the north and south branch of the Penobscot River come together. They're throwing a party in a pig roast tomorrow, and you are invited. I'd also like you to direct your attention to our website, 929theticket.com. That's where you can hear the show again or share it with others. And... I've been shooting some video up here so you can actually see what we've been talking about. Once again, it's 929theticket.com. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine is brought to you by EBS Building Supply, Van Raymond Outfitters, Napa Auto Parts, Hammond Lumber, and the Old Town Trading Post. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine airs every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. on Sports Radio 929 The Ticket. <laughs>